school complaints about making a million dollars in sales. So I was in a corporate job over 20 years, quit my job, dived into Amazon, and now I run a seven-figure business. I thought, you know what, this is the time to bet on myself, to double down myself. Put it all on right The time is now. So you went from 130,000 a year, working 60 hours, to about 250,000 a year, and about three hours a week. Yeah. When you break it down like that for people, that's amazing. And that moment came to me and I thought, well, hang on a second, you know, why am I not proud of achieving a million dollars? Why is it that I straight away think that I'm not good enough? They went to Amazon and said, hey, these listings are infringing on our patent. Amazon have a look and go and close those listings. Wow. You know, I mean, obviously when that happened, I was thinking, oh my gosh, that's the end of my business. What, what, what do I do? We might share the product. One product is over 1.1 million employees. And so here it is. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Unemployable, the podcast for all you unemployable people out there. We have a very special guest with us today who has just literally jumped off the plane uh, from Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, Helen Cheng, welcome to the pod. How are you? Thank you. I'm feeling very good. Very excited to be here. Yeah, you're in town uh, for a, a summit this weekend full of e-com sellers. Are you speaking or are you just a guest? I am speaking. I'm part of the um, the million dollar panel, I believe. Yeah, Is yeah. that right? Yeah, well, congratulations. So how are you today, Mark? What's going on, buddy? Yeah, doing pretty well. Looking forward to um, having another Amazon fellow Amazon seller on the panel. So yeah, looking forward to digging into your story. Mate, did you get the call up for the million dollar panel? Are you, uh, is that too beneath you now? Are you oh, feel like the $10 mate, million dollar panel? No, no one called me. No one called you. No one called mate, me. You're, you're on the panel every week, I suppose. So a bit, bit of uh, sunshine. Maybe I've, been sn- <laughs> Maybe I've been snubbed. Well, you never know, mate. <laughs> what about you, James? Did you get a call up? Mate, uh, those days have gone, gone. <laughs> Amazon, what? I can't even know how to spell it. <laughs> Eric, how are you? I'm very good. I'm just uh, seeing what uh, James has up his sleeve since. Uh, I got him good last podcast. Yeah, so we'll see you sniped him yeah, right on you. the bell. You did, right mate. On the it, it, what they call like a, a rabbit punch, a cheap I shot. I bulletproof a, vest today. Yeah, <laughs> a, a, king, a king hit, if you will, you know, from behind, <laughs> all, all those things all That'll at once. So. No, I'm excited. Thank you for coming. This is going to be a really good pod because um, Helen's got a really interesting story, She's uh, which you're going to tell in, in, a, in a moment as we unpack this. But what I love about this story is the simplicity of it. It's not like you've got 50,000 products out there. So just in, you know, just telling listeners, what is the headline of your story? We're going to dive into it in a minute. What's the headline numbers on your story? Yeah, absolutely. So I was in a corporate job in corporate world for over 20 years, quit my job, dived into Amazon, and now I run a seven-figure business. And um, the business, one product is over 1.1 million in US a year. Yay. Uh, wow, well from a single product. One and so you product. came from a corporate background. This is like a complete divergence for you from that. Yeah, it is. And it's it's been an amazing journey and I, I love it. So what what why should somebody who's sitting at home um, sit around and invest an hour with us now? Like what are they going to learn from you that you think is quite unique? You've watched our pod. Your story is different. Your vibe's different. What do you bring that's unique to somebody listening? Yeah, I would say that if you feel like you have everything in life already, but you are feeling that itch underneath, like there is something out there, should be more, something more, something more fulfilling and something more beautiful, but you don't know what it is. And that's a position I found myself in a couple of years ago. And fast forward two years now, I am. it's been an amazing growth, an amazing journey. And if you feel that itch, I would absolutely encourage you to, to, to go to go out there and explore and do something. And I'm here to share my journey with you of what I found that worked really well for me. And I hope everyone out there finds something for them. And has it been two years since you started? It has, yeah, two years. Wow, yeah. that is absolutely incredible. From where you were to two years later, 1.1 million US a year. And you're number one in your category for your product, which is pretty amazing on such a competitive marketplace, not just one, number one on Australian Amazon, but number one on American Amazon and we are going to reveal the product on this pod and I want to say up front thank you for that because I know as an Amazon seller that's a big step uh, because a lot of times people are worried about um, being copied but as you and I know there's a lot to it and you've built a a moat around your business with your reviews and different things so um, stick around guys because we're going to reveal all of that 
But before we do, we're going to have our usual little bit of uh, opening uh, banter, <laughs> things that we want to talk about uh, leading in. First of all, we want to thank our sponsor, <laughs> again, Early yes. Bird AI. Um, and we will uh, reveal that that is a company that we own because we are not good enough to get real sponsors yet. Eric, <laughs> you got something to say? Speak for yourself. <laughs> yeah, I we, thought we paid for this. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of did, really. Yeah, we kind of did. We, we I swear I've seen it in the line item. I know. <laughs> Anyways, early bird AI, guys, if you're wondering what it is, um, if you own a business that has a website uh, or does any business online or, or really in the world and you're not using AI, even people like you, uh, Helen, who've got Amazon businesses, there are certain solutions that AI can really accelerate your business. And uh, so Eric and I funded the company, two young guys who their sole mission in life is to actually get small business owners using AI and um, showing them how to blow their businesses uh, up and take market share from their more established competitors mm -hmm. through being smarter. And there's this moment in time right now where that's absolutely possible, but it is intimidating to most small business owners. So if you want to find out how AI can be implemented in your business quickly and affordably, just go to earlybird.ai and earlybird is with an I instead of a Y in early, as in on my t-shirt here or on the gap there. Go check them out. You can have a half hour free consult with boys uh, they'll have a good look into your business and show you ways that uh, you can implement AI in your business. So thanks for your support on that. Um, now, I'm going to do something a bit of fun before we kick into this story, which is my favorite reel of the week. So I got sent this reel this morning and you know how you're always getting motivation and business reels and after a while you get a bit overwhelmed. This particular one got my attention and brought a smile to my face and it's done in a way that only Aussies could do it. So let's share this reel because it is good fun to get us in the mood. You know, a lot of people say the best revenge in life is success. Mm -hmm. But if you just go out there into the world and crush it, that'll get it. That'll show them. Yeah. Wrong. That's a loser mentality. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the best revenge is to actually follow someone when they leave their work. Okay. You're in your car and you follow them. Yeah. And when they're walking down their street towards their home, you mount the curb. Wow, okay. And you actually mow them down. And <laughs> when they bounce off your windshield and are laying on the ground struggling to breathe, you go up and lean down and whisper in their ear, gotcha. I mean, that's just a much more satisfying way to get revenge than becoming successful. That's what I'm talking about. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> how good is that i want to give a shout out to the creators of that uh of that particular clip uh, greg you're going to put them on there um on the screen but uh these are uh two aussie comedians that uh, that sorry i'm just going to bring it up because i really want to give them a shout out because they've contributed here andrew hamilton comedy and alex smilinkovic anyway it'll be on the screen when we do this but follow these guys. They're hilarious. They've got a whole account of doing like success and motivation themed uh, reels. That <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I, I, yeah. In the world of social media yeah. today where everyone just goes on and tries to pick up someone's routine or whatever, someone's <laughs> going to take that literally. I just know it. <laughs> you should see the comments. The comments under this reel are absolutely priceless. Like, I could imagine that. Uh, so anyway, thank you for the laughter and uh, we appreciate it. So now let's turn our attention to Helen because this is a great story and we're really excited to have you on because you're one of the first ladies to actually join the pod. Um, we, we have um, had a couple now and the female vibe is different and you have a different approach to business. And I know that it's difficult. When I was running Reliable Education, we always struggled to get ladies on the stage, ladies to put themselves in the spotlight um, because um, you know, for a bunch of reasons, which we'll probably get into with you, it's, um, it's not sometimes it's easy. So we really want to say thank you for, for um, reaching out and offering to tell your story because you could just quietly make your million dollars a year uh, in sales and, and not tell anybody. So why don't we start there? What made you actually do that? Because I know it's not in your wheelhouse day to day. Yeah, it's definitely a, um, I've taken this step with, with an intention um, to fully embody the identity of a successful entrepreneur. Hmm. So I am very into mindset work and working and connecting with your inner self. It's something I have focused a lot since quitting my job. And, and you need that and you need that in a journey of entrepreneurship because it's it's a it can be very lonely sometimes and I honestly think mindset makes probably one of the biggest difference in a person's entrepreneurial journey. Um, 
I reach out back to you, Drew. Um, so, so when I reach my first million dollars, I send you a screenshot, Adam, with my thanks. Obviously, you know, you have been instrumental in helping me to get to where I am. And you said to me, hey, congratulations. If you're ever on the Gold, on the Gold Coast, come on our pod. And literally when I read that message, I, I just laughed out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I just laughed thinking, I'm not successful enough. Like, I'm not good enough. Like, who, who am I even to, to say anything, to share anything? You know, why do I have anything that's worth sharing? Who's going to listen to me? Um, and, and, you know, and I sort of, you know, obviously moved on with my day. And um, if, uh, probably about a month later, I was working through some journaling and, and that moment came to me and I thought, well, hang on a second, why why did my mind go there straight away? You know, why am I not proud of for achieving a million dollars and more? You know, why is it that I straight away think that I'm not good enough? Um, and it's an area I've been working um, on for the last four to six weeks on why do I feel like this imposter syndrome and and this self-limiting belief um, that is that is really not serving me. So I really wanted to work on on getting rid of that, just um, really break break that you know break through that self-limiting belief, so I can continue to grow and to level up and become mm. you know the next version of me. And and I want to fully embody the identity of a successful entrepreneur. So if I, and to do that, I want to behave and, and think in a way that a successful entrepreneur would. Um, and um, we can talk into yeah. a bit more. So there were quite a few steps I went through to sort of go through that and um, taking the step to be here today and, and many others in future, um, I truly believe will, will just help me to level up to that future version of who I want to be. What did you What did you find at the bottom of that bucket? Like, why do you think that you felt like you weren't worthy of that? Because I know, I remember when I was starting my Amazon mm -hmm. journey in 2011, I found myself in a conference in Las Vegas and they said, oh, um, these people come up on stage and they were all people doing a million dollars a year. And I remember myself sitting in the audience going, oh my God, like if I could be one of those people, that's insane. Like I remember thinking that was just so far out of, so that's where you got, and mm. I, that was me in the audience, and I'm a pretty ambitious guy, and I was blown away by these people. So what, what, what did you find when you dug in to that? What, 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 what do you put your reasoning down to why you felt like you were a fake or whatever it was? Yeah, I think um, press by, I, I guess a pass to a million dollars is so different for everybody, and just because mine was perhaps a little bit shorter than I, than I envisaged, I my mindset perhaps haven't caught up with, with what I had already achieved mm -hmm. because I was, you know, things were going so fast and moving so fast. I'm trying to gather on the business side, the, you know, the cash flow, the, the, the um, I was constantly out of stock mm -hmm. um, and managing and pretty new to, to Amazon because I've only been live for probably um, 16 months now. So, you know, there were other areas of Amazon I was still learning. And then and I reached that milestone so quickly. And when I first started, a million dollars just seemed just somewhere so unimaginable, you know. Um, so I, I think, yeah, because because of the speed and then my mind just hasn't quite quite, quite caught up with that yet. So, so one minute you're like a student, yeah. like everybody else sitting yeah. in the audience, you know, metaphorically, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you're basically a nobody. Yeah. Um, I mean that respectfully, no, no, but I mean you're just yeah. one of the many people trying yes. to be successful and then all of a sudden you launch this one product, which we're going to show you guys in a moment on the pod, you launch this one product into the world's largest retailer and then you're struggling to keep up with just having enough stock in the warehouse because people loved it so much and all of a sudden, like that, the universe has kind of grabbed you and just put you to a whole new level and inside you're still the same um, person, but yeah. your results change yeah, massively. Yeah, that's right. And and you know that really came out of the blue, and kind of something really creeped up on me. I mean, I obviously when I quit my job, that's a whole other story which we'll go into. But it was a complete different mindset when I first started. When I had so much belief in myself, I just knew I was going to succeed. Um, but and compared to when I could see that one million dollar coming up, and then all of a sudden I felt really lost. And it was such a strange time because. I couldn't really, I don't know who to talk to. I mean, who, do, you know, like who complains about, you know, who complains about making a million dollars in sales? It was just such a, such an odd, such an odd thing to, um, it was just so strange, you know. Um, 
But I, you know, I mean, I, I, I and at around the same time, um, I came into a really challenging sort of business issue, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And um, and that issue almost closed down the business. Um, but it's also the reason why I am the only person in that niche today. <laughs> so, you know, there's there's always, you know, lots of different sides um, to an issue, depending on how you view it. So when that, when that problem occurred, when I was having the mindset, thinking, oh my God, I'm not successful enough. And it's almost like it was validating what I was thinking that, see, I told you, you know, it was was all too good to be too true, you know, too good to be true that I was just lucky. This happened when you ran into the issue. Yeah. And, yeah, and you're looking at possibly losing it all and you, yes. and you kind of felt relieved maybe. Like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, now I can was, go back to my comfort it zone. Was, it was a bit of a self-test. You know, there was some self-sabotaging talk and self-negative talk like, you know, hey, it was just beginner's luck. You know, it was just, um, I was just lucky. So it was it was just too good to be true in the end. Um but, but, you know, I, I worked through that. I worked through I that. Got, we've got a pod that we recorded a couple of days ago. It's not actually out yet Yeah. Um, that I really want you to listen to because I think you'll find a lot in it um, mm. for you. And it was a lady that came in and she specialises in emotional intelligence and yeah. understanding why we re- react the way we do to mm-hmm. love, to success. And all of us here mm. thought it was perhaps the best pod we've done. It's yeah. not out yet. Mm. For men, women, entrepreneurs, everyone, even though she focused on working mostly with women. But I think you'll find a lot of value in that. Mark? Yeah, I was just going to ask, it, that the imposter syndrome, is. do you think that was the first time in your life that you'd experienced it? Because I know that for me, every it's like new level, new devil. Mm. Every time I'm trying to achieve something more, the imposter syndrome re-emerges mm. and resurfaces. So is, was it the first time that it hit you had just come out of the blue or is it something that out of university or what? I mean, on, on reflection, uh, I mean, no. I mean, I uh, probably in my in my previous corporate life. I mean, every time when I probably when I had a promotion, and at the time I left, um, I remember I managed quite, quite a large team, like sort of forty people. And I remember in that last year of of my corporate life, I really felt. And I worked in supply chain, and we all know supply chain during COVID was was just you know, crazy. Mm. <laughs> and I remember. Um, you know, feeling that way too back then. But I guess the, the, the difference now is um, I've been working on my inner self, sort of that inner work for a number of years now. So I've got better tools to, to mm. deal with it. And exactly like what you said is that I view that imposter syndrome is, you know, if it just you're in, a, you're in a new environment or situation that you're unfamiliar with um, and that, you know, a little, you know, you haven't been there, it's unfamiliar, maybe a little bit scary, but if we want to be familiar all the time, we will never grow. Mm. Um, so I, you know, I, I recognize, you know, so that, that's the steps that I work, I, I work myself through that to recognize that it's an opportunity for growth mm. and that say to yourself, hey, it's it's okay. You know, if you feel a little bit uncomfortable or anxious, it makes sense because it is new. It's normal. Um, yeah, exactly. If you want to grow, this is <laughs> this is a path, one of the pathway to growth. Just yeah. on, on business for a second, um, just to interject, what are, you, what are your margins? Yeah. Like what are you earning out of your turnover? Yeah, so I have a 20% um, net profit margin. So yeah. after PPC and, and returns and so on, yeah. So PPC is pay-per-click advertising for the people listening. So... Helen advertises on Amazon, I'm assuming. All your business is on Amazon? Yes. Just everything. on Amazon America? Just on Amazon America. So yep. you live in Auckland, you buy the product from China? Yep. From China, you send it directly from China to Amazon in America, and after paying the advertising costs, you get some refunds on Amazon, which is natural, um, and we'll dive into some of that a bit later, yep. um, about 20%. So at 1.1 million, it's 200 and something thousand in change and US dollars, so that's decent. Especially for one and a bit, <laughs> one and a half years. One other point there were on the business side of it as well, you mentioned, which I found quite, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I heard that correct, uh, right. Is you the only one in the space? Uh, there are a few others, but um, I, I had a pretty serious patent challenge. And um, so that patent holder basically shut everyone down in the business. I was the only person that managed to reactivate my listing. So basically, they shut down my entire competition. <laughs> Wow. So, um, yeah, so I don't know. Shall we can you share that? that? Can you share that? that? Cause I, cause, I, yeah. yeah, I'm happy that, to go into that. That's yeah. probably other people in Maybe, maybe yeah. what we do before we share that, we might share the product. Yes. Yeah. Because okay. I think I think everybody's got to see the product so they understand contextually what we're talking about. So, Greg, can you maybe throw the product up on the screen? So um, what was cool is I asked Helen, how do I find this product? And she said, just put in portable bathtub adult um, 
into Amazon America and it'll be the number one result. And it was. <laughs> and so here it is. So I've got these kinds of buckets, I guess, under my sink, but they're not a bathtub. They're like a cleaning bucket, collapsible cleaning bucket. Yeah. So this is it. it, it this is the product. It retails for how much is that? If you can just scroll over. Yeah, two hundred and thirty-nine. Two hundred and thirty-nine dollars, and yeah, you can see some pretty cool imagery there. The legs, I imagine, fold down. Yep. So for the people listening on Spotify or on Apple or somewhere else, and you can't see what we're looking at, imagine a collapsible laundry bucket. You know the ones that collapse down, but imagine that as a bathtub with legs. That are sort of a frame. Yeah, that's right. For adults. For adults. <laughs> yeah. Not for kids. Do you don't make them for kids? A kids bath or do they just use a washing basket? <laughs> Oh, the kids, the kids can fit in everywhere. Frank, Frankie's got a kids version of one of those. That's, a laundry, oh, that's yeah. what the laundry sink is yeah, for. Yeah, exactly. That's that's kitchen sink, right. laundry so what, sink. So what was the, let's, before we get into the pattern challenge, what was the inspiration? Like, was that a pure data find? Like, did you use some software and go, go by the data? Or were you particularly passionate about taking baths? <laughs> <laughs> I do love taking baths. Yeah, he's not. But, yeah, but it was a pure, it was a pure data find. Yeah. Right. So before I launched this, I did have a test product as well. It was this, this beautiful handmade mosaic lamp. You can hand it outside. You know, um, solar powered and everything. I ordered a hundred units of those. I want to test out the end to end Amazon process. Um, that was, you know, they failed like financially. I think I lost like a few thousand dollars on that. But you know, learned huge. You know, just just purely by putting a product out there on Amazon end to end, you really learn a lot. So took all my learning out of that, back to research, purely based on data. So I obviously used um, a number of softwares. Um, Zonguru is one of them. It's really helpful. So I looked at the demand. Um, I could see there's lots of people searching for an adult bathtub. So a lot of people live in, in apartments in the US, um, obviously don't have a bathtub. Reno for a bathroom, may not have a room or the budget. So this is where this comes in. Um, yeah, purely data. And um, so you just <laughs> like you went into the software. <laughs> you you were searching around for high demand products, low yeah. competition. I imagine yes. limited supplies. Are those the kinds of filters that you were looking for? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I um. For people not familiar with Amazon business, I mean, I because Amazon's not in New Zealand yet, so sometimes I find it a little bit tricky to explain to people exactly what it is. So <laughs> the best way I explain it is that when people think about, hey, I'm going to do a business, they usually think I'm going to come up with this amazing product or some service idea and then sort of start from there. But with an Amazon business, it's um, I see it's almost like the other way around. So there's this amazing marketplace where lots of people are already visiting and searching for products. So the business model almost becomes, hey, what is this? What are people searching for that this marketplace is not offering, or not offering enough options to meet people's needs? Um, so essentially, that's what Zonguru came down and helped me with the numbers, and then I crunched the number out there um, and decided to go with it. Um, it is a, it is quite an expensive item, so I mean I didn't set out to <laughs> to um, to launch such a high ticket item, but I, I narrowed down the number of products, and I really felt this one had the biggest potential, um, and just went for it. Yeah. So you you identify this as a niche. Did you have a mastermind that you were working within? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I do want to acknowledge the Iman from my mastermind is here in the studio today. What's up, Iman? Me. Nice to have you yeah. in the studio. Also another kick-ass female entrepreneur. Yeah, <laughs> good. We love that. So Iman was in your mastermind and that's a really important thing too, right? So if you're on your own, you're sort of in this echo chamber of emotion, <laughs> like, you know, like a glass chamber of emotions. Uh, but anyway, you're there on your own. You're wondering, is this a good idea? And now you're like, got some people to look at this with you. And they were like, wow, is that the response? Were they like, Helen, I think you really found something here. Is it Was that the universal sort of response? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you're 100% right. So a mastermind really helps because, you know, entrepreneur and especially Amazon, I mean, it's it's so different and it's really important to have a mastermind um, that you catch up fortnightly, we call it fortnightly, and just to uh, sort of bounce ideas with each other and, and to keep going. I mean, the, the mastermind Emma and I were in, we initially had six people and honestly, to this day, there's only two of us remaining. Mm -hmm. Everyone else have... So your mastermind is just the two of you now? Uh, we've joined it with other masterminds, yeah. so we, we keep going, you know. But I can tell you universally yeah. the number one indicator of success was people who were in a mastermind and the number one indicator of failure was people who weren't. That yeah. was it. 
Not only did they get to vet their ideas, but they also got support and encouragement when they needed it and so on. Humans just work better for the most part in groups around new learnings like this. So, yeah. so okay, so you found the product, you got a mastermind and you're now going to source it. We'll get to the patent in a minute. I haven't yeah, forgotten about right. the patent no, infringement. Right. Um, but I just want to go through the steps mm. because I know there's a lot of people listening to this that don't know what an Amazon business or the mm. steps involved in doing it. So, okay, you go, okay, this looks interesting. You look on Amazon, were there lots of sellers at that time? And if so, what made you think that you could take market share from them? And then I want to talk about how you got the product. Yeah, there were, um, so so this collapsible bathtub is, is relatively new concept, I guess. So, I mean, you know, obviously we've seen that collapsible laundry baskets and so on and, and baby bath as well I mean I, I've got a I've got a little one I've got a baby as well so quite quite commonly you see that in a baby bath but not so much in a giant adult size so I could see within a niche what was currently being offered is either in a um uh, oh, see that advertising next to it, that um, that cylinder upright, yes, upright yes, shape. Yeah. So there was a lot in that. Um, that very like popular, baths. yeah. Very popular was ice bath, but in that um, or in that form and shape, but a slightly elongated version or inflatable. And, and you know, I mean, just reading. Was there I mean, any like that? There were a few, not many, but they were terribly branded. So <laughs> they were terribly branded. So terrible Photoshop. So in terms of the overall branding, they were just really badly done. Were they so, Chinese manufacturers directly? Or do you think? Oh, 100%. So yeah, they were just 100%. Chinese manufacturers listing yeah. directly on Amazon America. Yeah, 100%. But there wasn't somebody from the West who had that Western eye. Yeah. And mindset. Yeah. And even with those listings, the poor listing, I could see a couple of them were doing really well because, mm. I mean, they already had some, some of them already had some reviews. So you've got that social proof. So, mm. you know, they'll encourage more buy. But I knew that if I were to source something similar, but slightly different, a little bit better. So, um, so for example, when I launched, most of the bar stuff that were available back then were either like this baby blue or baby pink color. So they've just taken the the infant baby bath idea and blow it up into an adult size. But as adult, I mean, who the hell wants to go sit in <laughs> James, you know? love James, love James, <laughs> baby pink suits you, you well. Know, I mean, we, we don't, you know, we don't really want a baby blue or baby pink bath. So you know, I went, you know, first of all, the most obvious one is a color differentiation, and I also went for something a little bit bigger, you know, just to so you can fit, you know, somebody a little bit taller, um, or if you want to bath a couple of kids um, together or something. And I did a, uh, I mean, I did a proper photo shoot with those, and I and I can tell you, for a large product like that, it was not easy to yeah, photo much shoot. Harder. You didn't do yeah. the uh, the old trick of just superimposing somebody's head into the no, bath. Like no, I I hired a, a model and everything. I, I mean, you know, because most houses in New Zealand and probably Australia too actually do have a bath in it. Yeah. And if you have a bathroom that is big enough just show me it's real it was so difficult to find a venue to shoot but I knew that was going to make such a big difference because people the whole thing about having a bath you know is you want to relax and you want to convey the image that this is what you could have um yeah so I I put a lot of time and effort into the branding I reckon a celebrity endorsement could be prime if it's to be Ricky Gervais I think wouldn't it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. side joke yeah, so that's, you were able to you're able to get a hero image there without a white background can you talk us through that as well what do you yeah. mean by that is that so a hero right? image on amazon the first image that you see is called a hero image and what mark's referring to is that it is amazon's terms of service or policy or whatever that all products must have a pure white background as their hero image yeah. not with anything else that doesn't come with the product including the human Usually, yeah, I've yeah, yeah. swiped a few but times in use. In use images like fairly. There's a lot risque. of there's a lot of categories where yeah. it just gets sort of like a blind eye turned. Is that the case here? Or yeah, I think so. I mean, I think yeah. it's a bit of a grey area depending on the niche. So I mean, if you were to look at that particular niche, pretty much everybody's hero image is the lifestyle. You know, yeah, well, lifestyle you know what's pretty cool about this product is like. If you want to have a bath in your living room, you have a bath in your living room. If you yeah. want it on your balcony, you on your balcony. It's not like you can remove your bath from your bathroom, you know? That's, That's pretty cool. Have you, you got any photos of people having baths in weird locations? Yeah, in the middle of your backyard. Uh, it's all bathrooms. There's, there's some cool images in the if you scroll down a little bit in the A plus content, but most people do buy, they do have it in their um in in the bathroom. Yeah, but hundred percent you, yeah, you can have outside. it outdoor. Cool. Yeah. Camping outdoor. Um, on your next door neighbor's yard. <laughs> 
<laughs> on the unemployable set. <laughs> so, okay, so you found this cool product and it is. Now, did, were you able to find it? So what we're looking at there with the frame and everything, was that all available or did you create any of that? Or was that all just off the shelf? It's, a, it's an off the shelf product. Yep. Yeah. So it's an off the shelf product that you found on Alibaba, I'm guessing? Yep. Okay, so you found a supplier, Alibaba. How many units did you order when you first started? Yeah, I ordered a full container, um, which which sounds like a lot, but it's a large it's a large product. How many units is so it? So three hundred and fifty. Okay. Yeah, it's so still a I lot have... at that price. Like, there's a you know. Yeah, and, and do you know what the the crazy thing is? I mean, my mastermind. I remember their jaw just dropped. So I ordered a full container, and a week later, I ordered another container. Wow. <laughs> this is like while my first container had just left. You like got and the boost of confidence. I thought I. I mean, we were heading very close to Q4, and I can see based on the other competition, like I just, I just knew it oh, was like going to sell, and I knew that I'll run out of 350 units really quick, and I wouldn't be able to restock because Q4 was coming. And at the same time, we were, in terms of the supply chain, like the, um, you know, the um, the freight was starting to come down. I mean, mm-hmm. not drastically, but they were starting to trend down, and I didn't want them to trend up again during Q4. So I thought, you know what, this is the time to, to, to bet on myself, to double down on myself. The time is now. So literally a week later, I ordered another container. So <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, yeah well done. And, how, how much was your first container, dollars, in dollars? Yeah, it was around $9,000 just in product, 9,000 US. Yeah. And shipping was still really pricey back then. And I remember, I'll oh, never forget it. Nice. The first shipping, first container was thirteen thousand dollars. Mm. Second container, literally a week or two later, was ten thousand dollars. So about so twenty two thousand dollars your first shipment. Yeah. And how did you fund that? Out of savings or? A hundred percent savings. Yeah. So I have funded everything myself from savings. Yeah. Do you still fund everything now, just out of cash flow? Yeah. So I I feel really lucky because I I, I do have a a good margin. So I I'm, I've been able to reinvest everything back into the business, and I've I've taken some money back as well. Just do, to, have you worked out your ROI? Because that's an often an interesting concept for Amazon sellers. Like, is your ROI above or below one hundred percent? It's above. Above. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Because you you can self fund your growth when it's above. Yeah. Yeah. Which has been which has been good. Your, your competitors that you said were selling before you, yeah. um, the ones that you feel were straight from China, what what price were they selling the bathtubs at? They were selling at similar prices. Similar yeah. prices, yeah. yeah. So I wasn't more or less exp- – I mean, mine maybe was a little bit more expensive because mine was bigger. So, um, so mine is like 56 inch, which is about 163 centimeters. Yeah. And the competitors were just a little bit smaller, yeah. And I um, – Oh, you probably can't see there, but I also put in like this um, this underwater LED light. Um, sorry, Greg, if you just open up the image because it does bring up um, the rest of the images. Sometimes they don't just always click show. On it, maybe, Greg. Yeah, if you just click into it, please. Yeah. So soon, just go to the one next to the washing machine. Um, yeah, so I also include this really beautiful underwater LED light, so you really get that atmosphere. <laughs> going so um and, and lots of people comment on that they love it could you just click through those photos greg because this is a really really important part of selling on amazon yeah look at the beautiful these are these are great images these are well. great images look how much information helen is putting into these images um they're not just like point and click rubbish like you've, you're selling the benefits you're using the real estate of the of the available space you're demonstrating how it works it's and beautiful colors and branding. It's got that nice feminine feel. I love the font you've chosen there, ergonomically designed. It looks very boutique. And it's, Helen, it's did you did, did well you done. design these images? Like, did you choreograph them out, or did did whoever yeah, did the design work no. lead you through it? <laughs> no, I'm not that artist. So I I worked with a, a brilliant, brilliant designer, and, and she was absolutely brilliant. So I worked with a photographer for a, a photographer for a proper photo shoot to make sure that the designer has got high quality image to work with. Because that's one of the problems I've had. I haven't been able to find designers that can tell the story. Oh, look this at way. this. Look at the beautiful sparkle coming out at the top of the yeah. tub there. How much do you you spent on photos and graphics there? We're looking for those on Spotify and, and listening. We're looking at uh, seven photos that are making up Helen's listing here. I honestly Ballpark. couldn't write that. Ten grand, five grand. 
Oh, oh no, no, nothing like that. I would say maybe one or two grand. Wow. Oh my god! Yeah. Where did you find the designer? Yeah, I, I need to get that. Where did you find the designer? Gets. You don't have to tell us who the designer is, but where did you find them? Are on they Upwork. local or Upwork? Upwork. Upwork. On Upwork, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was a, uh, it was through a recommendation of somebody in my mastermind. Yeah, and that okay. particular mastermind, she's a designer herself, so she's very particular wow. about who she uses. So I knew that whoever she recommend and uses. I'm going to use so that can you, can you explain what Upwork is just for the people that don't know? Yeah, absolutely. So Upwork is a great platform with with lots of freelance um, freelance workers that you can hire on a on a short-term basis or maybe a longer-term basis from, from design to, to sourcing to admin and, and all sorts of things. And so they are obviously located in whichever country they're from. Um, you can look at their portfolios and look at the experiences and work with somebody you know, within your budget and, you know, within, depending on what you need. Yeah, lots right. of areas. Thank you. Yeah, so photos are so critical. If you're at home, I'm, I'm you know, I've, I've taught a lot of people how to sell on Amazon and this is one area that you've really done well. Um, you taught well, Adam. Yes, well, it takes a good student to follow. The question you're talking about, um, the LED lights, is that an upsell or a bundle package to maximise or is it included? It, it's included, yeah. And then you know what the LED light, I mean, it's like, what? $3? Can I ask probably an, maybe an obvious question to you, but to me not, and I've um, look, thought about this and I've, I've just looked at the listing, is how do you fill it? Have you got a, what would come in here is an upsell or something like you plug over a tap to secure it onto a tap so you can hose the, the bath in? Or I had, yeah. like, I'm a bit lost in the how do you fill it bit <laughs> because I looked through the listing and there's no attachment to do it. Yeah. And the last thing you do is cart buckets of water if you've got a saw back. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you can upsell that bundle piece. Yeah, yeah. So it really, so obviously um, to have a bath, you, you need the bath to be close to a water supply. So obviously if you don't have a space you want to, or if you aren't able to get a water supply, then you're not going to have a bath. Under the shower. You're not going to have a bath, basically, yeah. So if you, um, uh, sorry, Greg, can you just go back to the A plus content and just um, just scroll down a little bit. Oh, scroll up, please. Yeah, so there is a bit where I can explain. Um, just keep going up just a, just a little bit. Yeah, there, yep. So most people either have a bath that's big enough, they can actually have the bath within the bath, so within the shower. So they, their shower here, whether it's detachable or from above, can fill it from above. Or if not, um, so obviously I've got one of this at home. Um, <laughs> I also set up within my own bathroom, even though I, I have a bath, but I have a detachable shower here that is able to be close enough to um, to fill it. And same with drainage. So if you set that up within your shower, I mean, very easy. You just plug the drain. If you set up outside your shower, so there is included like a drainage pipe. It's yeah. extendable between 1.5 metres up to 3. It's further down there. Yeah, yeah. So it's got like a two-way two -way drainage. Oh, yeah, here we go. Yeah, two-way drainage, yeah. So mm. to fill it, though, it's a shower head, or and if not a shower head, yep. I mean, okay. host if you use it outside. <laughs> yeah. yeah that that's that's amazing to me yeah. that people do that, but they do. Did yeah. you, that add-on, add though, you can get them like a unique lockable clip over that universal to fit taps. Um, yeah, so it's got a, um, a clickable mm. a shower here. You can just leave it there. Fascinating. Yeah. Hmm. Did you design the smiley face into the plug? Because uh, <laughs> that is attention to detail wow. and you can see why you're successful if yeah. you did. Oh, <laughs> uh, that, that, that came with it. But I, I was going to put my brand on that. Um, and I thought actually, you know, like, I was like, oh, it's quite cute. <laughs> yeah. Right. How do you go with um, stock levels and ordering? Cause I see that you're currently unavailable up there. So is that you're out of stock I'm at the moment? I'm currently available soon. <laughs> okay. So how do you manage yeah. stock at the moment? Yeah, and try that, not that's to... been... That's been quite tricky, to be honest. Um, sorry, because it, I'm only on US. I can see that ships to Australia, so that could be another reason. Um, I have to change the um, delivery. Yeah, to, yeah. I, that, that has been really tricky, especially, I mean, I've only just done a full year recently. That yeah. gives me a better idea around, um, just around seasonality. Um, but also, it, it depends on, the, at the start, it was it was really on, on cash flow. Um, now I'm a little bit better, but, uh, you know, now I'm better with cash flow. I can fund, you know, I can fund the product from from profit. But I'm, to be honest, I'm still not great at, <laughs> at forecasting. I need to get better at that. Um, just in weird, weirdest, sorry, not weirder things, and some unexpected things happened as well, which is like last year, 
I got a taste of what an influencer marketing could be like. So mm. a, a lady in the US posted, um, she's not even somebody famous, like just like a normal person. She posted a photo saying, check out my new bathtub, not even my bathtub, someone else's bathtub. You know, I absolutely love it in her shower. Now I don't need to do our um, bathroom reno. Absolutely. That post got shared like thousands of times. I can't remember, like 7,000 or 10,000 times or something. And then I woke up, I remember waking up the next day, my sales was gone ballistic. And I was wow. like, I'm like, is, is this like a Black Friday? I was like, what what day is this? And wasn't even is... your bathtub that it she wasn't posted even, about. It wasn't See how powerful the demand is. It wasn't even is. my bathtub. So wow. obviously because she didn't tell people where she got it from, people naturally went search on Amazon. And then, I mean, I ran out of stock like two days. Um, also, that so, shows you, right? That's the power of yeah, Amazon is yeah, because absolutely. it's the first place people look to buy anything in America. Yeah. Uh, for those who don't know, Amazon accounts for more than 50% of all online sales in America. Mm -hmm. So add up every website that sells anything in America and they do less than Amazon does on its own, which is remarkable. You said something just before then and I, I did quite find it quite interesting. Um, seasonality. Do yeah. people take baths in winter <laughs> as well as summer? Definitely more in winter, yeah. So I, I, I definitely have much better sale in winter compared to summer, yeah. Let's jump into this patent issue. So what was the patent issue? Because I know, like, for example, yeah. there's a big thing um, in the space around USB, that if you put USB on the side of your box, um, there's these very clever patent trolls that have registered every form of a USB logo as a as a trademark and, a, and patent, and they will not let the goods out of um, customs until you've paid a fee. And so there are certain things, was it in that area or what's the story with this patent infringement? Yeah, the patent thing was really interesting. It really it really took me by surprise. So there are two types of patents, obviously. So one is a design patent and one is a utility patent. So a design patent is, you know, quite simple. You know, um, you just tweak the design of, you know, this mic a little bit and then, hey, I wouldn't be infringing on you. Utility patent, which is the problem I ran into, is, is a lot more different. So a utility patent protects a functionality of a product. And in this case, um, another company, quite a big company as well. So they have a baby bath. So obviously the smaller version, baby bath in there. And their, um, their patent, their patent um, claims the collapsibility and um, or the, that function of the bathtub. And, and I know that sounds really bizarre because we already have that collapsible functionality in, in, in buckets and, you know, laundry baskets and whatever. But the way the patent worded is very specific to the bathtub. So, um, so they're in the baby niche and literally woke up one day, they shut down everybody in the baby niche and everybody in the adult niche. Um, I didn't know what was going on at the time. I, was, I, I thought I was out of stock again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm out of stock again. I, you know, better do something. And then I realized, oh, actually, there's something more serious going on. Um, it's, you know, I mean, obviously when that happened, I was thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, what's <laughs> it's the end of my business? What, what, what do I do? Um, I, I got onto a patent attorney. I'm talking like American, a patent lawyer, <laughs> straight away to, to help me out. Um, and uh, so we, I mean, the way it works with an Amazon, when you have a patent complaint, is that basically they went to Amazon and said, hey, these listings are, you know, infringing on our patent. Can you please do something about it? Amazon have a look and go, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, sure. Let's close those listings. I went to my lawyer and said, what, what can I do? So my lawyer dropped a letter to Amazon and said, hey, in my legal opinion, I don't infringe. So Amazon is like, oh, okay, great, great. We, we agree, so we'll reactivate your listing. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, uh, Amazon's patent infringement sort of process. So obviously I'm um, reactivated, and I was the only one that reactivated within the niche, which is, which is great, but the problem is, is, is still there. So I reached out to the to the patent holder, saying, you know, look, um, you know, just so you know, I I reacted my uh, reacted my my last day. My lawyers don't think I I'm fringe, but you know, I don't want to I don't want to run into any any further issue on this. You know, that's discuss a licensing agreement. I'm more than happy to um, to work on that. Um, <laughs> I sent several emails and they never came back, and um, I. I uh, 
I honestly just think they can't be bothered. Um, so they are a large company that specialize in baby, baby. So, so I have a baby, right? I've got some of their products. Um, yeah, <laughs> they, yeah. they, they literally have everything from like baby feeding bottles to toys to, you know, whatever baby stuff you name it, they have it. They only have one baby bath, which is that one. Um, I also reached out to one of my competitor. I know it sounds really strange, not a Chinese competitor, a true competitor, who's also branded very beautifully. I reached out to them <laughs> saying, you know, hey, I see we we both are facing, you know, the same issue, you know, this is what I've done. I'm, you know, curious to see what, you know, what what options you guys are exploring. They, they were really good. I mean, we had a bit of a dialogue going and they said, you know, they had the same thing, reach out to the patent holder. They only heard back a, just like an acknowledgement, yeah, thanks for your email, um, never heard back any further. But they started out in Germany, they branched out into US, so they said, you know, look, we're just going to focus on your, um, on Germany. So I, yeah, so because they, I never heard they from and I, like I said, I just don't think they are interested because they, they don't have time. I mean, to go, you, and they can go next, they can go further if they want to. So I went back to Eric, you know, my lawyer, saying, look, let's, let's discuss what, you know, what, what's next? You know, what could possibly happen? And if they were to happen, what were my options? So, so yes, one option is absolutely, they can take me to court if they really want to. Um, is that likely going to happen? I mean, kind of not likely because um, we're not competing with each other at all. And also patent issue, patent disputes in the US has to go through the federal court, not the, not the state court. Mm. So, I mean, like if they were... Pepsi and I'm Coca-Cola or vice versa, I can understand you, you absolutely want to fight that out. Um, another step they could go through, another avenue, so they've got two basically two options open to them, is um, they could go through Amazon's got like their own attribution, attribution, um, attribution process, I mean, attribution process, um, which is they put in $4,000, I put in $4,000, and Amazon hires somebody sort of neutral, say. <laughs> arbitration. Uh, arbitration, yes, yeah, so yeah. you know, sort of who wins. Yeah. Um, so where is it now? It's it's. I don't want to go too far down the patent yeah, rabbit hole. It's too yeah, technical. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, so, so is it you're just like continuing to trade? You're not yeah, sure what's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. now five months later, I basically I had to decide: Am I comfortable enough with, this with risk. the risk to continue, or am I not that yeah. I pull back? And these are calculated risks, right? So yes. I decided: Yes, I will continue with the business with a non-risk. But I'm not confident enough to expand on the range. So what are you doing next? Like you've got this one product, yeah. you know, what's the next step for you? Because you are fairly focused in the one area. You've got yeah. a sort of a one-legged horse at the moment. What's what's the plan to sort yeah. of de-risk? Yeah, so the, the, the bigger thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to divert some of my product into a third-party warehouse. Mm -hmm. So if it ever happens again, um, you know, I don't have all of my inventory tied up in the same warehouse. But I am... I mean, I mean, I'm back to to product research. So I've got a few, a few, a few, a few products I'm looking at nice. that I'll be looking to launch this year. Yeah. My first product, just yeah. out of interest, was also challenged um, yeah. uh, by a much larger company, and they didn't have a patent on it, but they went after me for a thing called trade dress. But by the time that all went through, yeah. I basically said, look, I'm done with this product anyway. And I diversified into a whole bunch of adjacent products mm -hmm. and turned it from a singular product into like eight products that were diversified that went on to become really successful as well. Mm -hmm. So it's all learning and it's a journey, right? So Yeah, yeah. 100 percent And obviously, and also I know the I know the pattern really well. So I I I've got some idea also just around the way to tweak the product that wouldn't infringe on the patent as well. Mm. I mean, I definitely think it's a great, it's a great niche. And if I can, and I've got some ideas around that, if I can come up with another product that does not infringe on the niche, on, on the patent, um, that will do well. It's great. And it's great that you've got, had a bushfire go through it, you know. Um, you know, so, yeah, we've, we've done, there's a whole interesting discussion there, but it's probably a bit technical for a lot of people yeah. that you can go into. So you're going to basically, you're in research mode now, you're going to apply all that you've learned. Are you yeah. going to stay close to that niche or you're going to have a diversified portfolio just based purely on research? I'm going to have a diversified portfolio. Yeah, so you Good might work. be selling a bathtub and then you might be selling horse saddles. <laughs> You never know. Yeah, you know, that's <laughs> really the best have, part. <laughs> have you ever yeah. thought about um, directly selling on, on Shopify? 
Uh, I, I've thought about it. So part of, um, if I divert some of my product into a third-party warehouse, I'll absolutely be setting up Shopify, yeah. Yeah. And I love asking these questions. Mm. So um, in your corporate job, how much were you earning, if you don't mind me asking, when you quit, roughly? Uh, 130. So 130,000. Yeah. And how many hours a week were you working, real hours? Oh, my God, like crazy. I, way beyond. 50, I, I, 60? I, I, I don't know, maybe 60, yeah. 60? Wow. And, and how many hours are you working now in your business? A week. <laughs> well, so, so I'll 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 put a time frame on that because I had I had a newborn last year, right, in in February, and uh, you know, and we all know, gosh, newborn take a lot of time. And yeah. during that time, I would say only like a few hours a week. So on average, yeah. how many hours a week are you working? You think on your Amazon business? On this particular one, I would say maybe three hours a week. Three, three hours, hours a yeah. week. Uh, so you went from one hundred thirty thousand a year working sixty hours. Yeah, maybe. To about 250,000 a year, Aussie, roughly, 210 yeah. US, yeah. and about three hours a week. Yeah, and I mean, any more that I do is because I'm, you know, looking to launch more products, not not on this particular brand. It's a super leveraged model, right? Like Once you've actually set it up. Like, when you break it down like that for people, you know, totally. like, it's, when you work out the 130,000 a year, 60 hours over 52 hours, you work out what you're earning an hour compared to, like it's, it's chalk, like you can't even and compare And this, this is where it sorts the wheat from the chaff though, is doing that work up front, doing the differentiation, doing the research and getting the, getting the job done. And it's doing the work once and pushing that barrow hard. And once you've done it, it's done. And, and, and it's the, and you meant, I think you mentioned it earlier in the podcast, the, the mind game. And you said that you're really into the mind game. It, it is the mind game when, when you've just laid it out as clearly as you did there. <laughs> Why, why do you want to continue yeah. to work your nine to five? That's why I love it, asking these questions because people listening need to understand the breakdown, right? Like three hours a week on average. I'm sure you worked a lot more than that up front. But now this thing's selling. She's checking stock, reordering stock. Like what do you do with all your time? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's uh, uh yeah, so uh, so I mean five so about five months after launched that I, I, I had a baby, yeah, joining us in, in thank you in February. And um yeah, that took a lot of my time. But at the same time I was just I was so happy because the Amazon business, like you said, it's so automatic and you could really just sit back and maybe even just spend an hour a week even and would just continue to run. Yeah, do and you, I mean, the, the more time I spend on this because I want to expand onto other product range, not on this particular, you know, not on this particular brand. Do, do you ever feel a little bit complacent just in regards to, you know, I've got this product, it's earning good money, I'm cruising around doing what I need to do, spending time with my baby and, you know, working um, a few hours a week? There were times a little bit, yeah. I mean, a little bit when 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 life was really busy with a newborn, and I thought, ah, oh, you know, do, do I just let this continue and so on? But it's, um, but the thing is, I, I I also know marketplaces changes. You know, there's a natural product life cycle, so mm. you do always. I mean, maybe I could stay complacent because my life was busy for for a wee while, but I can't leave yeah. that for too long no, because correct. it will eventually, you know, things will change and you will get left behind. So. I knew that I, I have to keep going. Um, it, it's in, I think um, you used, used to say it with the rhino that we work in sprints. You know, entrepreneurs often work in sprints. You'll be three months at yeah. it sprinting and then you'll be three months looking after your baby. Hey, question for you. What, what was harder, raising a newborn or the Amazon business? Uh, I would say... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, it's a uh, tough one. Sorry, a husky just walked into, my, <laughs> sorry, into, into a studio. Um, yeah, you are you're not seeing things. Yeah, it is a husky. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is safe our studio dog. I would say, I would say the mindset. I, it always comes back to the mindset for me. Yeah, because you know before before the newborn came along, I mean, like you said, I was in that sprint mode, and and everything was was so exciting. I was at like such an expansion stage of my life. And then all of a sudden, a new priority came in and you really, you know, that, that really takes over your priority. And you, you know, I felt like I didn't have a lot more control over my time. Um, and I remember getting really frustrated. I'm like, oh, I can't have my morning routine anymore. I can't do my, my meditation and my, you know, setting my intention for the day. You just can't do that with a newborn. Mm. And I remember getting so frustrated. And then, and that I wasn't making progress 
on my business. But then I I just had to um, work, 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 work through that. And, you know, I mean, I think last year what I really went by was that, you know, stay committed to your goal, but flexible. Be flexible in your approach because mm. there was just something else in my life that was more important. So, yes, maybe I didn't have my morning routine, but I still managed to find days to meditate every day, just, um, you know, just just find a, a calm moment, yeah. So, so that is having a child was harder than running the business? I think adjusting your mindset. <laughs> yeah. So that, that there's an advertisement for anyone who's having a kid. Yeah. You're a perfect candidate for starting a business. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 100, yeah, definitely. And, you know, I, I'm so grateful, I mean, to have, you know, with Amazon, you, just, you have such flexibility with your time as well, you know. So, yeah, just everybody should give it a go. <laughs> What, what were the biggest challenges for you, do you think, in, in this journey? What has been the biggest, hardest thing that people need to know going in? Because mm-hmm. I know with Reliable, one of the reasons we had a lot of successful students is because we armed them with the expectation of hardship. Would, what would you say are the hard parts? The hard part is, is there is you're not competing with anybody else. It's a race of you against you. Hmm. You have to you have to have the mi- right mindset because if you don't, and if you don't work on your mindset, your life will just get busy. And it's so easy, it's so easy to fall back onto our old selves and our old behavior, our old patterns. And then you are just, you're just forever dreaming and nothing will ever happen. And then um, I will just go back to, to the self-limiting belief a little bit because what I ended up working through in the last few months is learning to detach from the external validation. So, and what I mean by that is that sometimes we are we are so conditioned, you know, the, the way we've grown up is that, oh, I must be this to achieve that. And it can be a, a an unhealthy loop we get ourselves into that, oh, you know, I will only be successful until I reach a million dollars. I will only be good enough until I reach this and that. So I really worked um, to detach from that that external validation and think that, what, why do I want a million dollars? I mean, what is a million dollar going to give you? And it's going to mm. give me freedom, and that's that's what I want. But I can embody freedom right now without that a million dollars. And when I do get the million dollars, what it's going to do is going to expand what I already have. Amplify. So that's, yeah, yeah 100%. So that's the, the mindset now that I go into. Um, my next goal is, is like, and don't, don't get me wrong, we all want to set goals and these are amazing goals to have. And I want, you know, my next goal is $5 million. Um, <laughs> and, and what do I think that is going to give you? And that is going to give me what I've always wanted and I, what I really do think is a purpose in my life um, is I want to be able to, to serve and to contribute, to off, be of service to something. And, and again, I can do that now too. I don't need to wait <laughs> Mm. until I make that five million. So I've really worked on detaching. And it's hard. It's a constant word to remind yourself to detach from that external validation. So you, you, it will always come back to the mindset for me. You, you mentioned mindset. You've mentioned mindset a lot. You're, you're big on mindset and, and yeah. I am too. I think it's it's so important. It's like 90% of the game. Mm. What are some really valuable resources that you can share with us and the audience on, you know, how you – have improved or educated yourself or, yeah, yeah. I don't or know what the word is, but yeah. set that new level yeah, of mindset. No. Uh, yeah, 100%. I, um, so I, I, am, I am actually in a, in a mindset coaching group. So, I, um, I, so there's an amazing podcast called The Mindset Mentor by Rob Dahl, top 100 podcast, go and listen, right up there with Unemployable Media. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually seen that podcast. I've heard good things. Yeah, so... Um, so I mean, what's it called? The mindset, the mindset mentor. mentor. Yeah. Yep. So he has a you know a private sort of paid um, a group that you join as well. So I, and, and you know it's so funny when I first quit my job, I I never thought mindset was a thing, and I didn't go and look for it. I just you know I made sure I joined a, a business a business group that was that was your group, Adam. You know I be, I made sure I was equipped with with what I needed in terms of that skill set. But I, I just really believe that they're saying that when it's when the students ready, the teacher will appear. Mm. And that was what I really needed. And somehow I found that it came into my life. And then it's it's it changed my life massively. And another tool I will mention is um, the practice of journaling. 
is, is so, so mm. powerful. And I'm going to say that as somebody who's never journaled in my life before. Um, I used to think journaling was some, <laughs> dear diary, today I woke up at, at seven, I, I <laughs> ate a banana, I had a coffee, and then I went to work. Yet I, I used to think that's what, what journaling was. I didn't know anything about it. Um, and now it's, it's, it's so transformative, that the practice of journaling, because we live in a world full of noises and just so much noise all the time. And what has become really hard is, is silence, or silence with your mind. So talk us through your practice there. So what do you need to journal and how do you journal and when do you journal? Mm, good question. Yeah, so I, um, I now my, my, my baby is one and <laughs> she just turned one. I've got a bit more time in the morning now, so I always start my day with meditation. Um, and then I, I do a very quick journal. So um, in the morning, mostly I, I ask two questions. First thing in the morning is, what am I feeling now? Very simple question. Um, and sometimes it will just be, um, so today, I'll talk about today. <laughs> <laughs> today this morning I was like, well, you know, I, I feel really good today. I'm heading off, um, you know, to Gold Coast. I'm going to be on, <laughs> be on my very first podcast. Yeah. I am, you know, really anxious, but I recognize that it is also an amazing opportunity. I'm pushing myself outside of the comfort zone. I am, you know, going to speak from my heart and be authentically myself. Um, sometimes I journal a little bit, maybe stuff was on my mind. So when I was working through the imposter syndrome, that was on my mind a lot. And I almost journal on that. Most days, you know, a new thought will come into my mind, a new new revelation. And then a second question I journal for the day will be setting my intention for the day. And that could be really, really simple. You know, if it's a weekend, it's like today I just want to be really present with my family. I, I don't want to be have any any distraction or whatever. But obviously for today in particular, I I want to make sure that I I I um I share my story in an authentic way and hopefully that they, they contribute and, and help other people in some way. I love that. It's yeah. so simple. Yeah. But it's so question number one, how am I feeling? Question yeah. number two, what are my intentions for the day? Yeah. It's so powerful because you intervene into the creative process yeah. of your reality. Yeah. Whereas especially now, where mm -hmm. people just never ending scrolling yeah. doom, being dragged down all kinds of rabbit holes. Um, yeah. without any conscious intervention into their own lives. Exactly. It's so beautiful to be the observer of your life rather than just being yeah. taken yeah. and washed it's away. It's a beautiful yeah. book if you haven't read it called The Untethered yes. Soul. It's He's possibly brilliant. one of the best books I think I've ever read. Um, I think it's by Singer, Michael Singer, yeah. The Untethered yeah. Soul, and it is an absolute ripper about becoming the observer in your own life. There's no one that explains that like he does in no. that book. Have you have you read the surrender experiment? I have, yeah. That's incredible too. Yeah, yeah. It's an he's an amazing author on this subject. So mm. don't miss how powerful that is, guys. Like that's actually something you've got to do to understand. It's not something you can listen to on a podcast. You actually this is, it changed my life as well when I went and did uh, Rick Cowley's re mm. retreat, Vision Quest, is creating the space for the inner voice to be heard and then listening to that inner voice and engaging with it, um, otherwise known as being crazy. There's a yeah. book. <laughs> <laughs> no, for real. I mean, We're it's so true. Guys. If you don't hear a voice coming back, people go, oh, you're crazy if you hear a voice mm -hmm. coming back. I'm like, no, you're actually you crazy really? if you don't. Yeah. Right? It's the opposite. <laughs> just, just on that, I'll just give the audience, just, if you're journaling for the first time, what I encourage you to is go seven levels of why. Why? So how am I feeling today? I'm feeling this why because of that why. Because mm. that why is just going to lead you down like your, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, there's another good book on um, ju morning journaling or morning pages. I think it's called the The Artist's Way. Have you read that? No, yeah. uh, the artist's way, yeah. It's the artist's way. I can't. I can't remember who the author is. Maybe Greg can find it and throw it up later. But it talks about the whole process. Quite a Rick, few of us. Rick done. Rubin. Rick Rubin Rick uses Rubin this process. Uses, yeah, yeah. And we've recommended the um, the Stoic um, book that's out where there's basically one Stoic concept a day on a page and then you have the journal that comes with it by Ryan Holiday. So it's the thought and then you sit and you reflect on that thought and you journal about the thought. But anything that basically gets you engaging with you in your own life and pausing and asking self-directed questions, very powerful. And, and and knowing who you are as well, like if you're a visual person, uh, journaling is really good. If you're an auditory person, record your morning journal into your iPhone notes. And if you're a kinesthetic person, 
get on a surfboard and start screaming it. It's quite therapeutic, <laughs> isn't it? When you see that voice, there's something about like a, a, one of my followers on Instagram, a girl that I follow, um, she's a hairdresser um, uh, here on the Gold Coast and she's a real little hustler. She's really, you know, I really respect her. her. Her partner actually was my stretching coach for a while and she reached out to me and said, Adam, like I'm, I'm starting to have anxiety attacks. She's trying to get a journal. Uh, sorry, she's trying to get her side hustle going and she's mm -hmm. just running as a hair salon a million miles an hour and doing this. And she texted me and said, what do I do? I've, I'm freaking out. And I'm like, just get your page out, a uh, piece of paper, blank piece of paper, and put a circle in the middle and write me. And then draw a line and put another circle and put my relationship. And then another circle, my health, my business, my side hustle. And then go around to each one and then create little offshoots on each one of what are you thinking about in regard to your relationship and I'm worried about this and I'm worried about that. And it's a journaling exercise and you basically go through and you unpack all this stuff that your head is trying to process. James, you would need butcher's paper for you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? That would be, that'd be a horror show. <laughs> you keep going. Let me finish my thought. Um, and basically I advised her and I advise this to anybody who's feeling stress and overwhelm that when your mind sees that you have now externalized this and expressed it into the physical world and it's sitting on a piece of paper in front of you, first of all, you go, oh, my God, no wonder I'm stressed. You're not crazy. This, this shit is real. Like, you, you know, you are probably worried about being a good mom. Is my baby getting enough rest? Am I feeding my baby correctly? Is, am I giving my baby future issues by doing this or that, right? <laughs> so as a mum, you've got all this stuff you're worrying about. Then you've got your business. You're worrying about patents and you're worrying about what if the supplier cuts off or what if, you know, and then you've got your relationship or whatever else is going, your health and you're worrying about, am I eating correctly? Am I doing all the things that I should be doing? So when you externalize it, you're, there's something in you relaxes. It's like taking mm -hmm. a breath. Yeah, 100%. And then you can attack things one by one and actually manage it. And always it's worked for me. And she DM'd me back and was like, oh, my God, that's so amazing. Mm -hmm. And it's so simple. It's just stopping and acknowledging that you have a lot of shit going on and nobody in this world today doesn't have a lot of shit going mm. on. Yeah, 100%. So journaling, I couldn't agree more, Helen. I think it's yeah, a huge the, gift. There's some pretty all. pretty powerful things you've shared there. Eric. You're waiting, right? I can <laughs> feel it. I can feel. It's like when you got those <laughs> shorts on. I know what's waiting for me, bro. Uh, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just thinking back to the stretching coach. He must have fired because you were stiff as hell coming to your car this morning. Honestly, I've been sitting here for the last five minutes, fucking about to die. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> what's the joke here? I haven't got it. I said back to your stretching coach. I said you must have fired him because you were stiff as hell coming out of your car this morning. <laughs> oh my god. I I know, seriously. You're walking around like a robot. I know, dude. Well, yeah, wait till you get to, to my age. Oh, geez, this is normal, Helen. This is just, it's uh, not normal. This is the podcast. Be careful what you say, hey, stretchy coach. Oh, this, man, it just doesn't that's stop. Like... <laughs> so, Helen, um, we've, we've got morning journaling and meditation is also a big part of your, your day. Um, I think it might be just beneficial to close with some ideas around that because you're pretty zen. Like, unlike the four of us, you're like this calming force <laughs> so in the corner of the honestly, desk. Yeah, I can listen to you at that voice. Like, it's just so calming. Well, you wouldn't know this, the listeners, but before we started, Helen said, all right, before we start this, guys, we're going to share a minute of silence. And she put on this meditation app. And I was like, well, that's a, that's a, a, a new thing. Yeah. And it reminded me of like, and we're so caught up bullshitting each other all the time that sometimes you need to just calm down and get centered, which was a really nice thing so how in, how important has this sort of meditation practice been in your life and is that a new thing or have you always been like a chill pill it's definitely become more of a new thing since i left my since i left my job mm. yeah i mean when i when i left there there was a period of i guess just discovery and and, and reflection of what i had left behind and then I, yeah, I found the world of, of meditation and journaling. It's just, um, and the thing is, what's most amazing is I didn't go and look for it. It just, it, it just sort of suddenly appeared in my life. And because I was at a stage where I was so mm. receptible to grow and, and to learn, I was just open. And then, and this came in and I, I, I yeah, and I took it and, and I, I love it. It's, I mean, I'm still the same person, but I am also so much 
more. I, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you you get it. But yeah. yeah. Helen, this is probably a, a whole new podcast in mm. itself, but did, did you have a process of having to clear out some some junk before getting to that stage where you were open? Because I think that's a, a lot of like people James out there. You start with a monkey and you hear with symbols. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a lot of people out there, I think, struggle to get to that point of openness and, and maybe you can share a little bit on that. Yeah, it was probably... I, I was say probably a good few months of. <laughs> Sorry, James. It was the joke we said about. It. I said there's monkeys in James Edward with the cir- with the symbols, and he said, "No, I've got a whole circus in my head," <laughs> yeah, which is actually a very good description. So carry on. <laughs> yeah, I um, yeah, hundred percent. I think I I probably went through a good month or two just de-stress and also just released all the uh, everything that I left behind that that no longer serve me i i went for lots of long walks and they were brilliant and i and do you know what that was like the best time of my life i i felt like i felt amazing when i left after a few months after i got rid of all of that i felt so so empowered like i've never felt before like when i was back like I was a child again, you know, when we were all children, we we're all so pure mm-hmm. and we believe we could do anything. We could be an astronaut, we could be a, a superhero. And that's how I felt. Like I, I just wow. felt like I could be and do anything I wanted. I, and that was just, it was like a familiar, but because, you know, we all felt like that when we were children, you know. Mm. And and that feeling, I'll never forget it. It was so amazing. <laughs> I that's felt when so you free. Left your job. Yeah, well, a few. Yeah, when I left a few months after I got rid of and released anything, that all that doesn't suit me. That 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 remains within everyone, right? That yeah. that childhood feeling, and it's just yeah. sometimes you just get all this junk piled upon it, and and it gets a bit clouded. But it, yeah, that process yeah, of, yeah, of clearing it out that, is that cleaning. For, yeah, it was amazing. Mm. Yeah, that that to me, hearing that, Helen. I mean, I've been trying to teach people to start businesses um, and for a long time and mentoring and coaching. But what, what you just described there is the goal, mm. right? Like that's, it's not a Ferrari, it's not a boat. And the way that you said that, you know, that is just, it's very moving mm. genuinely and very powerful. So if you're sitting there listening to this, I know somebody sitting listening to this on their way to work, going to a job they hate, right? And knowing that waiting for them are negative people are people that like to shoot ideas down that are just waiting to pull them back in the crab bucket. And they've just heard what you've said and gone, holy shit, that is the thing I want. I want to feel like Helen felt or that you feel it. I can feel it sitting next to you now. There's this, you're like the cat that got the cream, which is such a beautiful thing that you've achieved something, but that you appreciate it and you're resonating with it. And so many people are miserable with way more than you, but you're actually so satisfied and calm. And that to me is the great win here. And um, I think it's I think it's amazing. So, I would have loved to meet you when you're in the, your corporate job and see the difference. Mm-hmm. Transformation, yeah. Yeah, the transformation, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think I, I think if I were to go back now, not that I, not that I will or I ever will, <laughs> <laughs> but I think if I go back now, I have, I have, I'm a different person now. I definitely feel like I'm a different person now. So I have better tools to to manage and deal with things differently. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're definitely unemployable. Yeah. Definitely, Helen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so in closing, what would you say to somebody who is in the situation that you're in? They're working their backside off. They're uninspired. They feel trapped. Um, have the itch to do something have more. the itch to something else what would be and and don't feel like like often people will see someone with confidence and um you know someone like me on the internet that can talk into a camera and they're posting all day and you just don't relate to that person at a deeper level somebody who's considered and calm and like yourself um i mean we're different people but I know there's people listening to this going, oh, my God, Helen is the one that's giving me so much hope right now. Not James, not Adam, not these boys. They're really jamming with what you're saying. You're like this light that they that for them. What would you say to that person that is listening, that is vibing with you and your vibe right now but doesn't know, doesn't quite feel that they may have what it takes? I, my, I would definitely advise them to, if they can, find a an afternoon, a morning, preferably say a weekend of a long time, just them and themselves and no one else. Go somewhere, 
by by yourself because you really need to quieten your mind and then what and, and ask yourself what do you what do you really want what, what do you really want and and start from there because what yeah, that, that, that's where you start. and certainly that's where I started because I felt I wanted something more and that, and that's where I started, yeah. Mm. Find a quiet moment. You can't have all that noises um, all over your mind. You, you've you got to find that, 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 that silence within yourself and listen to your thoughts and, and your inner self. What, what do you really want? I think, I think Amazon was such a good fit for you because yeah. um, you could quietly create something magical without having to be on Instagram and without having to be a, the face of something, you could create, you could look at a market analytically. You don't need to have this avert personality and you can just be really bright and smart and just observe the market, create a beautiful listing, be analytical. That's, that's what it's so good for. And the number of times I would see people like you come on the stage and we give them an award and they're the most unassuming people but they're very thoughtful and, and that's where e-commerce can be really powerful because it levels the playing field of personality. <laughs> yeah, 100%. You yeah. Know? yeah. Uh, like we had Andrew sitting here a couple of weeks ago and he's also quiet. He's an accountant. He's doing $15 million a year at $5 million net. Yeah. And he's not like us. He's quiet, conservative accountant, but he's smart, you know. So anyway, I, I just want to finish by just really thinking about our listeners for a moment and, and sending out a good intention to you because I know there are thousands of people that are going to listen to this um, and send you a word of encouragement. Consider this a note from your future and um, uh, just a little reminder, a little whisper in your ear that there is more waiting for you. What's stopping you, as Mark said, 90% of the game is played in the six inches between your ears. And um, this is all about mindset and giving yourself permission to have a go. And you gave yourself permission and and then you so so beautifully eased into this new life with gratitude and yeah. uh, peace and I can't wait to see what you do next. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, and I really, really genuinely thank you for coming on because it's people like you that I want more people to hear from mm. because it's usually people like me with a big mouth and a big smile as opposed to people like you that are, um, you know, just quite achievers. So I appreciate it. Thank, yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks thank so you much. Very thank much. You. Yeah, we'll see you next time. And you at home, thank you for tuning in. Go check out Early Bird. Bye for now. Hey there. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Unemployable. If you'd like to watch another episode, just click there.